Hi, and uh, thanks for joining this session. Um, we're, we're sort of a bit different this year, obviously. We're all online. It's all a bit weird. I'm used to standing in front of you all having a chat um, and talking about all sorts of bits and pieces. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Colin Daniels, and I'm the Working Aging Young People's Service Manager for the Macula Society. Uh, I've been working for the Society for you know a few years now. It's, I think it's cruising up to six. Uh, I started as a regional manager, and, and now I'm the Working Aging Young People's Service Manager. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, we're going to talk about employment today. Uh, and you might think, actually, every time I see Colin, he's talking about welfare benefits. But actually, for, for quite a long, long time, for action for blind people, I did, I did uh, several things. Where one of, one of the things I did was is support people into employment. Um, so today, and obviously with the way of the world, we're going to talk about employment and those kind of things. I think the first place to start with this really is to sort of talk about where we are in the world. You know, we've got COVID-19 and coronavirus and everybody's worried about losing their jobs. And the most important thing to do is also always remember that that might not be you. And it's as stressful as it is, losing your job is awful. And we know that, well, because people talk to me and they, you know, they, They've got a, local, a latest diagnosis or a diagnosis that they've just got. And there's a few things they worry about. And one of the main things, or the three things, I suppose, are, are my children going to get this? Can I drive? And what am I going to be able to do about my job if I have one? Now, quite often we, we hear, and I've, you know, I've heard this over the many years, that people will go to the eye clinic and they'll speak to their consultant. And the consultant will give them a diagnosis of macular disease, whatever that might be. Um, it could be Stargardt or Best's, cone dystrophy, or, or there's so many more, isn't there? And they say, well, you'll have to give up. You can't work anymore. And people leave there and they're given very little information and they just, they go home and they're feeling really vulnerable about their job and their prospects and what they're going to do next and how they're going to tell their family because they might be the number one bread giver, bread maker, bread giver, bread maker, you know what I mean. But the most important thing to remember in, the, in those areas is never quit your job. Never, ever quit your job. It's so important to stay employed. There's so many things that we can do and, and think about and consider when, when you're working to continue doing that and moving forward. We'll talk about that a little bit later on, more, more a little later on. We do know, though, um, sadly, that if you have a sight loss or disability, that it does take, you know, two times longer, twice as long to get a job than it does for somebody that hasn't got a disability. So if you can imagine the, the, the job market at the moment, it's actually quite buoyant. It, there's lots of people being made redundant, obviously, because of COVID. But um, if you actually look at the job market, there's still plenty about. Um, but it's about who's going to get those jobs. So it's about finding out and making yourself stick out from the crowd. The, uh, that's my phone in my office ringing, which is a bit annoying at this point, but there we go. Um, we have uh, to really consider how we can make an effective application to make us stand out. And when do we talk about, when do we talk about our silos and how do we talk about that moving forward? So you've been told that you've got a new condition. Uh, you know you've had some difficulties with your eyesight and you've gone off to the consultant and he's told you that you've got a, a macular disease. Now you've got to tell your boss. How are you going to do that? What's the best way to do that? What does it mean if you tell your boss? What are your respons What's his or their responsibilities and what are your rights? It's very important that you tell your you, you tell your organization that you work for and your line manager, but it's the way that you do it is so important because actually, if you do it badly, it can make it twice as difficult or more difficult to stay employed because they will panic and they do panic because they may not have had somebody with sight loss before working for their organization. You might be the first. So the thing to do is to take a breath and then consider the best ways of doing this. I have just done a series of videos 
uh, with with someone, a employment manager from uh, a support for site in Essex. And, and the greatest piece of advice she gave uh, over the video that we did around this, we call it disclosure, but it really is just telling your boss, really, um, is to do it in an informal way, but kind of formally. Don't do this standing in a corridor in passing because actually they might have loads of questions and you're not going to be able to answer them. Also, if you do it in an informal way, but more formally, you're able to maybe not record the meeting, but record the email trail to that meeting. So if things do start to go a bit wrong later on, at least you've got some evidence that you, you were involved in that conversation from the start and trying to find the best way, best way forward. When we think about sight loss and the workplace and then your boss, all those things tied together, what we need to do is provide solutions to some of the difficulties that you may have or may have within the role that you have. So there are things that you can do and you can suggest. So you'll know a little bit about your vision and how it works. So you can maybe suggest that you move your desk so it's not quite so close to the window. Uh, if you work in a factory session, um, uh, setting, then you can find ways of getting around that, you know, the bits of that role that were more easy for you to do. So one of the things you can discuss with, with your line manager is about a bit of flexible working. So you make your job more flexible to, to suit you and suit them. And it's important that this is a, a negotiation because it needs to fit both sides. The other thing that you can do is to um, maybe suggest a lateral move within the organization. So, for example, if you're unable to do your job anymore because it's just practically impossible because of your sight loss, maybe there might be something that you can do in your workplace that you can still do with your sight. So, for example, I, I've been contacted by loads of lorry drivers over the last six months. I don't know why it's been a thing. Um, uh, even to the point when uh, patients, my uh, support worker, was popping, popping up on interactions onto database, she said, crikey, what, another one? So there's been loads. So obviously, you know, stating the obvious, with a macular disease, uh, disease uh, driving is probably not a very good idea, especially a lorry. However, there are things around lorry driving that you might still be able to do. Uh, you, if you've been there a while, will probably understand the routes and the logistics of, of, of that, uh, that organisation, the routes the lorries take. So might be, they might be able to utilise that side of your skills. Um, you may be able to support the, the people on the ground um, because you've got experience, but doing it from an office. Um, you might know something about a, spe a specific drop-off, for example. Um, that the new person taken over for you that's not going to know, so you can pass that information on. It's all a bit, you know, it's about finding those little areas that are, are easy to sort of pass on. So there we go. So flexibility and maybe re relocating into a different job. Now, the thing is, we, have to ex we do have to accept the fact that sometimes, sometimes jobs are impractical and you may not be able to continue working in that role, or even for that organization, they may not have another role for you to move into. But again, that's about uh, negotiation and conversation, which is why it's so important to have these sort of informal, formal chats, because that protects you under law. The other thing that your organization might expect you to do is have what's called an occupational health assessment. Now this actually protects you and it protects the organization. So there's usually an independent uh, organization, unless the uh, people that you work for is a massive company and they've got their own team. But quite often this is an independent assessment. And you'll find that quite a lot of those occupational health assessors are aware of sight loss and know some of the ways around some of the difficulties that you have. And they will then start to explain to your line manager things that could be changed and adapted within your work to keep you in post. 
These are called reasonable adjustments. And they are reasonable both for you and also for the, 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 the employer. Because making too many adjustments might mean that you're no longer doing the job that you're being paid to do. So it is, it's, it's finding those, those reasonable adjustments, what is considered reasonable. And as I say, this could just be little changes. So it could be moving a desk, um, providing you with some additional lighting, maybe a bigger computer monitor if that's if you're sort of doing a lot of work on the computer. These things don't cost a lot of money, and and they're as I say, they're reasonable. But what happens then if you get to a point where actually that reasonable adjustment is expensive or comes it comes with a cost? which is too much for that company to, to take. There's a brilliant scheme, and I know I've talked about this before, called Access to Work, which will cover all those things that are outside a reasonable adjustment. So those little things we just, I talked about a second ago, so like things like computer monitors and moving desks and things and lighting, that's all with in-house, that's all within your employer's remit. However, other things can start, sit outside them, so maybe a bigger computer monitor will help, but won't help fully. So you need some additional software on your computer. Yeah. Now, there's various different magnification softwares that are on the market. Um, it's horses for courses, which one you prefer. Um, I always talk about it as, um, you know, people talk about Vauxhalls and Fords in, in cars. It's exactly the same with screen readers and screen magnification. You find the one that you like and, and stick to it. So those bits of software are quite expensive. Access to work would fund that software. Now, obviously, this is a government scheme, so there are a few hoops to jump through. And I have done another video on, on access to work with, uh, with Juji from, from Support for Sight, um, which you might want to have a look at. But it, it's, it's well worth doing um, because, again, it keeps you employed. Because those reasonable adjustments uh, that are provided by work, then topped up with access to work grant, um, means that potentially you can keep your job much as much as it is and in much the same way. He says, stumbling over his words. The other thing that access to work will cover is, um, is things like travel to work. So you might not be able to drive anymore. Um, and you might be a bit of a distance away from work and public transport's a bit difficult. So access to work will provide, will provide taxis to and from work. Now, one of the questions I'm asked quite a lot is how far will those taxis go? Well, that really is down to the access to work advisor, um, but in a nutshell, quite a long way. Uh, I mean, you know, I used to travel, I used to just outside Norwich where I live, um, and um, that was just over 20 miles to get to my office in Norwich. Um, and, and they were funding it to and from every day. Uh, so they will pay for quite a distance. But it is all down to, to cost, really. Um, you have a set amount of money um, at the moment for a, for a rolling year. At the moment, it's just over £58,000 for support. And that can include loads of things. So as I say, equipment, one-off equipment costs, travel to and from work. Um, and also, if you, you do a job uh, where some of the tasks that you can do can't be sorted out by equipment or aids and adaptions, you might be able to get a support worker. Um, now, I have a support worker. Some of you may have met her. Her name's Patience. And she um, supports me with just those things that I am unable to do. Now, one of the things that she does for me, obviously, when we're, we're not all locked, locked down and not, not traveling, is she drives for me. She drives me about um, because I, I do travel the country for this job, as you're probably aware. Um, she also helps me on, on, on train journeys to find my trains and, and sort of, you know, where I'm going and changing trains and all that kind of stuff. Then she also helps me with some, with some admin. Um, so there's, there's areas of my work that I find quite difficult. Um, Excel spreadsheets being one of them. It's not all people that use screen readers struggle with them, but I, I don't find them the easiest thing. And that's uh, so, so patients will help me with those.
But of course, uh, your your support worker can't do your job for you. So you, he or she um, will only be able to do up to 20% of your job. But that doesn't mean that they can't support you with other areas of the job because they can see to do it and you can find ways around um, doing it. So maybe set up some templates to fill in yourself and then you give them to your support worker to do with whatever. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, Support workers are great. Um, I think it's a really difficult balance. Um, you need to find someone that um, you get on with because you're going to spend an awful lot of time with them. Um, but they are great. I, I, I couldn't do without patients, to be honest. I've got a very itchy chin all of a sudden. I don't quite know why. Um, so, reasonable adjustments, access to work, and being up front with your line managers. Are the, are the best things to do to remain employed. We have to consider, though, that these are providing solutions. So we have to try and do it in a very positive way. So when you do get to the point where you need to tell us, uh, your organisation, go to them, do some research, take information to that informal meeting about access to work, so you can give your, your organization the opportunity to help you um, and to show that you're being proactive around your condition because you want to stay employed. Uh, conversations I have a lot of are around people thinking they're going to have to give up their job. I ask them how long they've been in their, in their organization or who they've been working for, and they say 10, 15 years. It's going to cost them a lot more money to replace you uh, in training and advertising costs for jobs than it is to 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 try and help you stay employed with them. Uh, but it's just, as I say, it's just about being um, positive and finding solutions. Well, that's talking about if you are employed, but what happens if you're not? Uh, so you're out of work uh, for whatever reason. Um, you could be a bit younger. You could just be out of university or college, uh, or you could have been, uh, you know, the primary parent or a caregiver, and you're, and you're not working. So what do you do then? How do you talk about your eyesight? When do you talk about your eyesight? Well, the first thing you need to do, obviously, is write a CV. Um, the CVs are the most important thing, and they're not just for the employer, they're for you. It's for, to look at what you're doing, what you've done in the past, and highlight your skills. Being a mum or a dad is a skill, by the way. So if you've got a gap because you've got parental responsibilities, um, then you, you put that on. Because, that, you know, there's, well, I don't need to talk about that. We all know how, how sort of organised parents can be. Um, however, on your CV, don't mention your site. Don't mention your site. Because it's, it is part of you and it's important that you, that you explain your vision, but not at this point. On a to be on a level playing, playing field with everybody else in the job market. Because what we don't want to happen is if you're applying for a job with a cover letter and a, and a CV, they see your sight loss and pop you to one side. Um, so leave your sight loss off your CV. There is a bit of a caveat to that, though. If you're going to work for a sight loss organisation, or in the or in the third sector, sometimes it's worthwhile just popping it back in, um, because sometimes they they are looking for for somebody that has some lived experience um, of sight loss or another disability uh, for that role. So it's always worth if you're going to do if you're in the looking for a job in the third sector just to try to sort of pop it back in, um, but then take it out, uh, which is a, a, a thing to mentioned that your CV is, is, a, is a flexible beast. It should look slightly different for every job that you apply for. If you apply for job after job after job after job after job and you're sending the same CV, uh, it's, it, you're not searching for a job, you're just sending out CVs. What people want to see on the CV is that you've targeted their business. You've, you've got a little understanding of what their business is and you've highlighted that in the C, in your CV. And then when you write a covering letter, if that's the way the application form is, the application's happening, again, 
you make sure that you you highlight that you understand what their business is. But the covering letter again, don't mention your site loss. It helps you just stay on on a playing on a good playing field, a level playing field uh, with with everybody else. You're not lying. Uh, you're just trying to give yourself a fair go, really, especially with the job market that's going to be quite full. Uh, so then, when do you mention it? So you've, you you know you've written yourself a fab CV and you've written a fab covering letter and you've got yourself an interview. Uh, that is the point when you mention it. Uh, you get the cut, you get the offer letter for for an interview, um, and you call the org- the organisation to confirm that you have an interview that you're accepting the interview. And at that point, you tell them that you have um, macular disease, or some level of sight loss. And then if you need some support around that, um, you can tell them what kind of what support you need. It might just be that you, you might just need some sort of, uh, help just finding um, or, the, or knowledge to f- how to find the place where the interview is. So you, you know how to get to the building because you go in a taxi then you might just need to tell the receptionist that you've got a bit of side loss um, and, and then they can sort of almost physically direct you if that's, if that's what you need. Um, again, this is being positive around your vision and positive around your condition. Now, the other thing, of course, is you go for your interview and you're at your interview and they, and they say, um, have, you, have you got any questions? Now, you always have to say that you have some questions um, but this is a good opportunity to offer them some time to talk about your site loss and ask them questions there. And then you can give solutions around your site loss at that point. Um, and maybe if, you, if you've got some information around your specific particular condition and maybe you've, taken, you've been really clever and taken some information about access to work, then you can take that and leave that with them. Don't labour the point, um, but just leave them with that information. A positive outlook around your disability or sight loss at interview does stand you in good stead because it shows that you're a positive person offering solutions and are eager to work. And at the end of the day, they, they, they do need to have disabled people working for them as, as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as what the government says they have to. So um, a certain percentage. So that's always a good, good thing to think about. Now, as I say, we, we've, uh, with uh, Support for Sight, we've done a series of videos all about employment, from just an overview on, on, on employment, what to consider, things like voluntary work, just to get your CV going. Then we've got interview techniques, CV writing, cover letters, application forms, um, access to work, uh, disclosure, disclosing your site loss to bosses and things. So uh, they're all available on YouTube. Uh, and, um, you know, just just watch them at your, at your ledger if you, if you feel that they would be necessary, if you think they would be beneficial. And of course, you could always talk to me. Um, I'm available through the Advice and Information Service. So just give that 0, uh, 0300 30 30 111 number a call. Uh, or you can get me through the Working Aging Young People's Facebook group, which I'm sure you're all members of. If not, you can find it on Facebook uh, through the Macula Society pages. And you can just sort of request to join uh, and I will let you in. Uh, I, I sort of check it every day, really, three or four times a day. So these, these requests come in, people get admitted quite quickly. And it's a really good place to meet other people with central vision loss that are working and just ask those questions that you may have. I do support people with uh, understanding welfare rights and their benefits and statutory entitlements too. So if, if you've got any questions in those areas as well, please just please just contact me. Well, thank you very much for listening. It's been a bit different, as I say. I'm used to sort of, you know, wandering about with a microphone and chatting to you all, but this has been a bit different this year. I hope you found my talk useful, and if you do need any further support, just give me a shout. Thanks very much.